Welcome, everybody, to the How We Got Here podcast. Uh, this is Kristen Heratunian, your co-host. And I'm Kelly Madden. Hi, everyone. This is our first episode. We're so happy to be with you, and we're so happy that you're along for the ride with both of us um, as we share a little bit about ourselves, but more importantly, give space for our guests and give space for all of you to share about your journeys with mental health, mental illness, or even working in the field. So we're really excited you're here, or if you're watching, hello, uh, thanks for joining us. So Kristen, we, what, we're stoked. what's up? Yeah. We're just stoked. Like this is our first episode which means it's our first episode recording and your first episode listening. So thank you for joining us on this journey. Um, you know, I would say like the, the purpose of this, right? Like Kelly summed it up perfectly. And also, you know, we just like want to let you get us, get to know us a little bit better. Um, Kelly, what's Absolutely. been going on? What's been going on with you lately? Um honestly I feel a little bit bored I'm in my final year of grad school so I only have one class in addition to um being a baby social worker at a local high school which is phenomenal that's like probably my end goal so but I'm bored I'm like one class what is what am I doing but other than that just working at minding your mind plugging away with the minding your mind fam and getting ready for another exciting year of of speaking events and all of that good stuff but it's been it's been a nice um nice little relaxing reprieve given the busy summer that I had but what's up with you how's your week been my week's been it's been busy it's been I'm like on the opposite side where I have yes. not been bored at all <laughs> and I'm like I miss the times when I was bored and I was just hanging out like, you know, low key playing video games and just like doing whatever I want. But I I just spoke at Villanova yesterday. Yes, round of applause. <laughs> yeah, I just spoke at Villanova yesterday. I'm speaking there again today. Uh, it's like it was like a three day in a row process to like the young freshmen. And um, and I like I was speaking to um, you know, a couple of people. And I, I was saying like, why, like, why do you want me to be here? Like, why do you want me to speak to these students? Because it was something so unique because they were like, we're going to have you speak. And then we're going to do like these little breakout rooms where like, like, but in real life, they were like, we're going to do these breakout rooms. Interesting. You're going to leave and we're going to further talk about what you talked about. I love that model. I know it was really cool. And the cool thing was, was that like, it wasn't just that one week and then done, like they continue to have this conversation. And I was just blown away by it that, you know, I've a lot of schools and organizations that I've been to, and I'm sure you can attest like, they, absolutely. They think like the one conversation is like the end all be all. And it's yep. like, no, no, like this is this is work continues. Absolutely. I love that. Go Villanova. What's their mascot? They're uh, not Rams. They're blue. Rams Westchester. Oh, what is their mascot? Shout out to Villanova. Don't hate us. We love you. Bring <laughs> should, Kristen back. I should totally know this. <laughs> I, I love did, that they're doing that, though. I did apply to Villanova, though. Um, but we went to Penn State. We are. We are. Um, Villa Nova mascot. They are the Wildcats. Wildcats, get your head in the game. Get up. <laughs> so it's literally just about high school it. musical. No, for real though. That's amazing though that they are making a commitment to actually doing the work instead of. I hate to say band aid solution, but yeah, a lot of higher ed institutions are like, we'll do it once. Good enough. Go to the counseling center. That's enough. Right. Right. It's phenomenal. And if they say go to the counseling center, the counseling center is usually like, we'll see you in like a month. Yep. And it's like, oh, well, I just heard this person present. I related so much. I'm on the brink of a breakdown. I need to talk to somebody now. And it's like, well, we don't have the resources. Absolutely. Which, which is tough, right? But but it was cool. And it is, it's going to be cool to be able to come back today. And, Yay. Uh, 
you know, I don't usually like seeing people cry, <laughs> but in these instances, you do I'm, I'm cry like, it out. I'm like, I love seeing this person tears <laughs> alongside another person while they're crying. Yeah. I'm going to look at you in the eyes and make sure that you know that it's okay. Um, I love that. Love crying in public. That's, that's it for me. You can always catch me crying after my presentation in a good way, in a good way, good way. Good no, way. honestly. <laughs> Honestly. Love it. I'm so proud of you, dude. I know you're making the rounds and you're in the greater Philadelphia area. So that's awesome. Villanova, we'd love to go to a basketball game or something. If, you, <laughs> if you're listening, yeah, right. hit us up with tickets. Kristen will take us all. That's amazing. Are you, what are you like listening to, reading, watching in your like sparse free time, your limited free time that you have? Yeah, so I'm reading this book. Um, Jordan, who works with Minding Your Mind. Um, hey, Jordan. He, hey, Jordan. You <laughs> better be listening. Yeah, he recommended this book called Agora Fabulous, which, you know, I actually really enjoy it because, you know, it's Sarah. Sarah is her name, ben Benincasa. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. But it's basically about this woman it's like autobiographical uh, about like her journey through agoraphobia. And also it's hilarious. Like, it's not like this, um, you know, like very serious, which I love like very serious books, but like, she's a comedian. So like, she's like bringing you through her journey of like what it's like to live basically inside one room because that's where it brought her to where like she was afraid to use the bathroom and she was afraid to go out and like she couldn't eat she was like scared of eating and like you know scared of taking a shower and brushing her teeth and like a lot of that was like her adding humor to it was like really stigma reducing because like I was able to I like, love that. Like, laugh along with her and then be like oh it's okay that she's laughing I can laugh right and and like I can learn from it like I because I, I love it I didn't know a whole lot like I'm not a clinical I'm not like in the clinical side of things um so it was cool to be able I'm like halfway through the book um I'm really, yeah. really enjoying it it's just like sitting sitting on uh my nightstand so I love it I can't wait to hear about it when you're done and oh, we'll yeah. Uh, we'll put a link to Sarah's book in the bio of this episode, peeps. So yeah. check yeah, out. Not, uh, we don't get anything from it, but we love we Sarah. love we love Sarah. We want to promote her book. I love that. Yeah, Sarah doesn't know us, but we know Sarah. <laughs> we love you, Sarah. How about you? Listening to anything? Reading anything? I have like my usual podcasts on rotation, um, nothing new or notable, but I did just finish um, a memoir by Dr. K. Redfield Jameson. It's very well known, like in the mental health, the like clinical use space. I mean, um, I live with bipolar two disorder, so she wrote a memoir about um, and the reason I'm looking at my screen is because I pulled up the picture of the book. She wrote a memoir about living with manic depressive illness um, from her, like, I would say, like, early 30s as a resident at UCLA and her entering the psychiatric and medical field and profession um, and, like, how living with a manic depressive illness was almost like like you need to come out, like, especially in the medical field, especially as a doctor, and especially as a psychiatrist, um, just reading about her journey with navigating not only these professional spaces, but personal relationships and like coming out and saying like, to new colleagues, when she started working at a new hospital, like, this is what I'm diagnosed with. Like I live with bipolar one. Um, here's my charts, which I don't think you could do that nowadays with HIPAA and all of these laws, but no, she absolutely. showed her colleagues, like, here are my charts. Here's my hospital and medical history. Um, here's the phone number for my doctors and my oh medical my team. Um, so how she navigated that um, her episodes of violence and mania, how she recovered after an attempted suicide, um, 
and really just her journey with lithium. Um, I know, again, just a premise, I'm not a medical professional. I'm a future social worker. Give me like six more months. I'm there. But um, yeah, just a phenomenal read. And it's referenced a lot. Um, her memoir is in a lot of other books that I read about living with manic depressive illness. Um, and I was like, I gotta, what is the source? I gotta go to the source and read the first, <laughs> the first book. So it was phenomenal. I got it. I checked it out of my local library, but then the loan, the library loan ran up. So then I ended up buying it on Amazon, but definitely recommend. We'll link it in the bio. I don't even think you need to live with like a manic depressive illness to read it. It's just really relatable about how she has to navigate like these spaces. Like it's like she was coming out. Like, I don't know another way to say that. I hope that's not offensive to any folks, but she had to out herself in every way. Yeah. Well, it's like that vulnerability especially being in the position that you're explaining that she's in where like you are a in a leadership position you are in a position of like quote unquote like power right where you're like helping people and supporting people and guiding people and then to like mesh that with being vulnerable about like oh and here's all this other information about myself that maybe you didn't know and maybe you would benefit from like Yes. I don't know. I feel like for a long time, like that was something that was deemed as like weak. Absolutely. Yep. To be she mentioned that. Yep. Yeah. But it actually makes, I mean, I believe it makes you a better leader to be able to show, mm-hmm. you know, things that were once deemed as weaknesses are actually our strengths. Totally Which agree. Is so cool. I'm going to check that out because, you know, I know individuals that, you know, have that diagnosis and it can also give me insight on, you know, potentially what they have gone through similarly. Um, but not all, it's not all like, a, you know, putting it in a box. Everybody has their own totally. individual yep. experiences. And I think she captures that really well. And she also talks about how that vulnerability, like, imagine you were her patient and you like heard through the grapevine that your practitioner had the same mental illness or a similar one to you like I would have been like you're my first like you're you're my same but like if it was like hmm, you and I would think that way but like this was also the late 90s when she was writing this but like I have like family members who would hear that and be like well my doctor's not qualified she's fucking crazy Mm -hmm. and I'm like I mean you and I would be thrilled I would be thrilled but it brings up this this issue that at least I encounter as a future practitioner is like we bring so much of our own shit to the table like it's becoming more normal to talk about but at what level do you self-disclose and when you self-disclose to a patient to a student to a family that you're working with like what happens after that when you out yourself so self-disclosure is a fine line um especially in, especially in like the line of work that like you and I are in mm-hmm. <laughs> my, my entire career is based off of self-disclosure like and you're great at it me still navigating <laughs> you are fantastic uh Kelly and I presented together not too long ago and uh I was like Kelly crushed it and I don't know why you're making that face because you were very 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 good that's my first time in a Long Island high school and I've also been doing this for like almost seven years I that's, have not. That's part of it too. Um, it was amazing though. Amazing school. The name of the school is escaping me, of course, but just phenomenal team at that school. I can't even remember where I presented a week ago. <laughs> I know I know faces. I know faces, but that's why I'm so diligent with my calendar. <laughs> but I can say, I, I want to say his name was Paul. Um, the the person that like organized this whole thing was literally absolutely incredible do you remember I love that yes like he was like yeah like I push for you guys and I push for this yes and like, this is so important funding like, space yeah. he was like we have a breakfast whole week, a whole week of this and like the, yeah the New York bagels were like oh. always killing it can never beat those and just like 
fellow social worker to fellow social worker I was like you are doing the Lord's work period I mean I'm not religious but y'all get what I'm saying he's doing the Lord's work and like the kids would just like I feel like and our uh co-worker Musna was there we love you Musna um the three of us just kind of like could also tell like the students felt so safe and like we're walking in and high-fiving like him as the school social worker and their gym teachers and like they were just I was like what a healthy school what a great model and then he took us um he took me on a tour after of the school because I was genuinely interested but nonetheless we we have been so lucky to go to some really great schools no it was literally incredible um I want to see that was Northport East school district was that correct that sounds right to me northport long island yep northport east northport school district shout out to northport high school we love you we'd love to come back totally they were awesome um and who was our person our person was anthony here we go yeah (laughs) anthony ferrandino I remember you, Anthony. We love you, Anthony. Yes. Anthony is like the best and that school is the best. And, you know, like talking about like, just like going back to like self-disclosure, like, I don't know. I get like the question all the time. um, Like, isn't it hard? (laughs) Isn't it hard? Like sharing your story over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm to all different types of people and you don't know how they're going to react. And, you know, I think it's important for people that like, don't know what we do. Like, it's not us walking up. I mean, I I can't speak for other speakers. Well, I kind of can because we all do something similar, but it's not like walking up to a podium and like shaking and crying and like, you know, like we are like sharing our stories in a very empowering and impactful way we're like we're trained to do this um and I would be that person that was standing and shaking and crying at the podium if I talked about things that I didn't feel like or want or was ready to self-disclose you know what I mean like I can do this over and over and over again because it's, it's like the bigger pieces of my story but it's not my entire story Cause there's some stuff that I just saved for my therapist. There's some mm-hmm. stuff that I just saved for my friends. Cause I'm not ready to talk about it. And I don't have to be, you know what I mean? Like, I love that you bring that up because I think schools, colleagues, other speakers just assume we get up there and we tell it all. Like the, the pieces that we share publicly are a drop in the bucket. I remember building out, my presentation and story with Jordan and Caitlin over the past like two years ago at this point and I was like oh we're gonna leave this out I don't think we should talk about that I'm like wow there's like just so much going into this but people think it's like your whole life in like a 45 minute to an hour long presentation yeah sometimes 30 minutes sometimes 15 (laughs) (laughs) like oh my god Kelly I spoke at the school like it was like three years ago four years ago and it was during prom so like like prom the day was cut in half and on top of the day being cut in half the periods were cut in half again so it was like a quarter of a period oh my god so like I had like 15 minutes but the 15 minutes turned into like 12 minutes because of like everybody getting settled and like I have net I had to do it four times in a row and I have never spoken so fast in my life and it ended up being great you know like, what did you people, say were you like boom, 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 boom. like I'm Kristen I work with minding your mind mm, grew Next. up upper middle class had a lot of struggles mom attempted and completed suicide started using drugs got depressed anxious went to treatment went to a recovery high school now I'm here like it was Ta-da! <laughs> oh my god yeah it was like seriously like unbelievable and like I would stop on the bell the bell would ring and I'd be like uh, and that's uh, all I got thank you so much see ya 
I could never. It was, we get put in some tight situations, but we make it work. Always. We always make it work. Uh, always make it pivot. Work for the kids. Yeah. Always pivoting. Yep. All the time. Speaking of which, sharing stories. So as you all know, if you follow us on Instagram, if you've been keeping up with the podcast up until this point, um, and of course, I'm sure most of you listening are in the field of mental health or mental health advocacy, um, September is Suicide Prevention and Suicide Awareness Month, and this happens every September. Um, And I believe the week of September 10th, so this current week is like the actual recognition week um, that President Biden, I think just recently, I think I sent you a link to that, like just this year, um, declared that the week of September 10th is National Suicide Prevention and Awareness Week. So very exciting. But that being said, we want to share a little bit with all of you, um, a little bit about our stories. Um, When I say our stories, I say not only our lives, but um, our experience, both of our individual experiences with um, attempting suicide, surviving that attempt, and kind of how the hell we are still kicking it and how we got to this present day with podcast mics in front of us talking about it. So um, yeah, I, folks. Yeah. I still find it surreal that like we're sitting here with like Same. podcast mics and presentations scheduled and I'm going, you know, I'm going to the Eagles game tonight. Like it's, it's just like go funny. birds, go birds. Um, but it's just funny. Like, looking at my life and being like wow like I live in this beautiful home Mm -hmm. with you know my awesome partner and our two dogs and live in Philadelphia and like there was you're killing it there were many times in my life where it was like I'm not going to make it and like I know that like a lot of people probably more than we might know or think of have experienced those thoughts um not just once but like multiple times and daily weekly right yeah right and you know I think it's pretty unbelievable that all of the things that I didn't think would happen did happen in like the best Mm -hmm. way possible like at 17 like I wanted to die Mm-hmm. Like, I, I wanted to die. And, like, you know, they say, like, you know, people don't really want to die. They just want the pain to end. And, like, listen, like, I had told myself for a number of years that I was just given this really bad hand of cards and that everybody else had, like, a really good hand and that, you know, I grew up with, like, an alcoholic mother. She was also anorexic. I was the parentified child. Um, Snaps to that. Right, for real. Like, abuse in the household, father traveling the world for work, so, like, he wasn't home very often, and, like, you know, like, the stigma of talking about it and, like, not Mm -hmm. being able to talk about it was horrific, and, you know, it took me a long time to be able to, like, navigate how do I talk about the things that I had been through. And we still can't to a point. Right, right. Yeah. I'm still figuring it out. Me too. Almost, you know, like eight and a half years of sobriety. Like I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, Thank you. So proud of you. So proud of you. But like, you know, when we're talking about, again, like suicide prevention week, suicide prevention month, like my mother attempted and completed suicide. Um, And like, I look back through the lens of somebody that's in recovery today and see that you know, she was in a tremendous amount of pain. Mm -hmm. She took her pain out on to us um, throughout our childhoods and suffered with immense amounts of guilt and shame for the pain that was done onto her as a child, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Intergenerational trauma. Seriously. Like, which, you know, if you don't know what that is, go find a therapist. (laughs) Don't she said she said take the ear pods or the air pods out <laughs> don't don't look it up don't, don't do it please don't no yeah, you, you should you, you, no you should um you really want to be shook talk like look up parts work therapy um it's like 
oh, what do you mean there are different parts of me that need love and nurturing and care and that I need to learn how to reparent myself? Like, Who is she? We don't know her. I know. I'm like, my eight-year-old self is crying right now and that's why I'm trying. Always. Yeah. Um, no, but, you know, like I had a suicide attempt at 17. I was three, two and a half, three months into treatment, um, drug and alcohol treatment, attempted to take my own life, clearly survived. And that was the shift in my process of wanting to actually stay clean and try something different because like it was just like this jarring experience and like listen like this is just like part of my story but you know when I was sitting in that hospital bed for like a couple of days I begged and begged and begged like please let me call my dad please let me call my brothers and like the doctors and nurses would be like no And not because I wasn't allowed to, or maybe it was because I wasn't allowed to, but like they were just trying to like help me stabilize. Right. What I wanted was to get the fuck out of there. Valid. And they were like, you need to be here. Fight or flight, you chose to flee. Yeah, I'm always (laughs) fleeing. Me, I need that on a I need that on a mug. I'm always fleeing, not fighting or flighting. (laughs) Yeah, I know uh, for real though as a teenager that makes total sense developmentally yeah like I was fleeing um, yeah and I couldn't and I was kind of forced to like stay there and every time I'd open my eyes there'd be a new tray of food in front of me and I'd push mm-hmm. it aside and instead of like trying to get my dad to bail me out or get my brothers to bail me out. Like I literally just had to sit with my feelings and I Mm. figured out very quickly that like they started to dissipate over time. Like I was there for like a couple of days and I didn't feel as strongly about wanting to leave day one that I did day two or three. Um, And then we started putting together a care plan. Like where was I going to go? What was I going to do? And I did like three more months of treatment, but which is a privilege. Um, But, like, yeah, man, like, that's, like, just, like, a piece that, like, I I am a person that has attempted to take her own life, and I live a beautiful, beautiful life today, and I'm, like, looking at my dogs, and they're being so silly. (laughs) Hi, girls. 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 (laughs) Lydia is locked up in her crate with a peanut butter bone. She cannot handle being a casual onlooker to the process. No, I, like... (laughs) <laughs> wait I guess this isn't good for the listeners but those <laughs> they don't YouTube, care <gasps> look at the are. girls <laughs> this is a plug to watch the episodes back on YouTube so you can see our pets <laughs> our beautiful girls sweet girls boys animals um which are very therapeutic but absolutely that's a part of I love that you mentioned that at the end of your presentation that your animals are a tool in your self-care toolbox like I love that you say that no I mean when I had like two three four five six seven when I had like three years clean I got Esme my Sheba my baby Mm -hmm. and she was not a tool in my toolbox at first she was so she was a project she she was a problem (laughs) I was like you're making me want to relapse no no but like stop (laughs) no she wasn't um I joke because I can but yes you 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 have the years yes yeah um but she was a tough tough not to crack she was a ravenous crazy puppy and um now she's like the, the the best tool in my box because like when I come home and like let's say I had a bad day or I had a panic attack or a really tough presentation where like the kids just weren't cooperating which happens more often than people might think like I yep. come home and I put big sweatpants on and I put on impractical jokers or whatever and good choice and that's that absolutely so like I guess I would ask with you i mean yeah suicide prevention month suicide prevention yes week. like and listen like it's a tough conversation to have right um as we know that are yeah. listening like we will plug a shit ton of resources um mm-hmm. underneath this episode with this episode so you know kelly like what are some of your experiences or anything that you've witnessed in the field and with your own personal life 
Yeah, um, so in full transparency, because authenticity and transparency are two values that are important as a social worker and just to me as a human. Um, this is my first time uh, speaking about my own suicide attempt on a public forum that isn't like a presentation. I definitely speak to students, schools, administrators um, openly you know, through our line of work, I talk about it, but by no means do we ever dive into it. It's just not the place to. Um, but of course, I'm happy to talk about it today. I think it'll be a good um, and a big step for me, at least in my recovery, um, because for so long, thank you, dude. And I don't think I could do it without your support and coworkers support um, and friends support and my therapist, shout out to Joy. I know she's not listening because she told me she didn't want to for boundaries, <laughs> but I love you, Joy. She's like, I'm rooting you on, but I think it's best I don't listen. I was like, very fair. So shout out to Joy. Um, but yeah, using, not me using humor to deflect. Um, <laughs> for real, for real, that's me. Always. Yep. Um, yeah, I, very similarly to you, Kristen, had an attempt in high school. Um, it's like, I wouldn't say the climax of my story, but it's definitely up there as like one of the like moments, if not the moment in my young adult and adolescent life where I finally got help. And I think, um, unfortunately, um, I grew up in a family, extended family included, where it was just like, we don't talk about mental health. We don't talk about what is going on up there like very um Irish Catholic very like keep your head down keep going but I knew family members I knew my mom was on antidepressants so I knew people had an idea of what was going on but um yeah I grew up in a very um chaotic household um uh, abusive households um, through my teenage years. My dad was going through a lot. Um, and I now understand that when parents are going through a lot, as you stated like two minutes ago, they take it out on children. So intergenerational trauma. Yeah. So that was going on, was being bullied pretty severely at school, um, didn't have a support system where I could kind of go home at the end of the day and feel like I could talk about what was going on because I was parentified. I was just trying to survive and stay safe. I was responsible for things I shouldn't have been responsible for at like 13 years old, um, making sure I was fed, getting to school, you know, doing the things, Classic. doing the stuff. Yeah. Classic. Um, let so a lot sure, of, let me make sure that mom has showered today. Let we got spaghetti. Sure. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, no, literally. Um, and yeah, just a lot going on. Um, and obviously led me to feeling really hopeless because I didn't feel welcome or safe or cared for or nurtured at school or at home. Um, and that's a big part of my story. And, um, I, you know, this is a quote I say a lot, but I'll say it again. I didn't want to die. Um, for a long time, I had no active plan to harm myself or take my life, um, but I saw no way out. I was not only backed into a corner, but I was like in the corner scared and adults were like over me in the corner, so to speak, yelling at me and berating me. And I was like, I don't see any way out. So in my head, logically, I was like, this is the only way out. Um, and I now know like as a future clinician that um, to kind of assess someone for suicidal ideations and suicidality, a big part of making an assessment is learning about like, do they have an active plan? Are they sticking, taking steps? Like what is going on right now? Um, and I say that because I didn't, I didn't have a plan. I wasn't taking steps. I wasn't um, self-harming with an end goal in mind. Um, but one day it just like snap of the fingers um, changed. And I 
remember um, I was in the high school locker room. I was in 10th grade. Yeah, because it was 2014. So I believe I was in 10th grade. Math is so hard. Um, It feels like 20 years ago, but it wasn't. It was almost 10. That's embarrassing. Anyways. um, Whenever I say like... a decade ago I was 15 it's like yep exactly so yeah so make that noise in your head I was in the locker room and this horrible horrible girl took my clothes while I was changing and I was stuck in the bathroom stall in the locker room with like 20 other girls like a JV athlete like peak puberty like level and she had been like making fun of me and like the go-to phrase was like Kelly's so fucking annoying and that's what people would say to me I'm like I can take that tell me something new like I hear this all the time but then she took my clothes so that really sent me over the edge that that interaction whether you want to call it bullying whether you want to call it girls being girls is not okay for any that's bullying that's like that's like borderline like like harass sexual harassment so yeah I waddled out of the big stall and was like trying to find something in my gym locker to where um next morning my clothes were returned um but that encounter at school and then going home and constantly walking on eggshells and pins and needles because I didn't know when my dad was just going to snap. And when he snapped, I didn't know if it was going to be him yelling or him throwing a plate at my head or, and then some, you know, fill in the blank. Um, yeah, that really sent me, that particular interaction sent me over the edge. Um, I came home that night Um, my parents were divorced. So I was actually going to my mom's house. Thank God. Um, but my mom worked a lot. Like they get divorced. She had to work more. We, we needed the money. We needed the finances, the resources. And I was home alone. And I like, remember texting my mom that that had happened at school. And she was like, this is unacceptable. Like I'm calling the school or the coach, the athletic director, whatever, and I was so mortified because you don't want to be that kid. Like, I'm not a narc. I'm not a sissy. No, you never, ever want to be that kid. I got a story <laughs> when, like, I, I ugh, love like, these stories. That's like the worst. Go on. So, yeah. So then I started deteriorating because, you know, 15, 16 year old Kelly was like, I do not want my mom to tattle on me. They'll hate me even more. Um, and then on top of that, my dad and I were fighting, like we, we were always fighting. (laughs) We were always like in that, in those years of high school and those years of my life, we were never not fighting, but that particular day was just like, excuse me. It was just like, yeah, sent me over the edge, um, again. So I guess all of that said, you never know what's really going on with somebody and how your actions, whether positive or negative, can just send someone. Um, and I know like the girls that were doing that to me were children at the time. I was a child at the time, but also the adults in my life had a lot going on and were not treating me like a child as well. And I can now acknowledge that after years of therapy, but Um, yeah, that night I just, I felt like there was no way that things were going to get better. I felt like I was going to have to wake up for school the next morning and go to practice and be around these girls because I genuinely enjoyed volleyball, like the sport I was playing. And I was like, I'm not going to give up something I love because I don't have any friends and I'm being bullied because I looked forward to that at the end of the day to work through my anxiety, you know, spiking a giant bouncy ball really does help work through anxiety, believe it or not. Um, yeah, that was, uh, that was me and softball. Literally. So I was like, I'm not giving that up. Um, but yeah, I felt the walls closing in on me. I didn't want to face my peers. 
I can still feel right now as I'm talking about this, the anxiety that I felt as a teenager creep, those same physical symptoms obviously can cope with it now, but um, I obviously couldn't call my dad for help or support. I felt hated. Um, I, there were a lot of verbal exchanges that made me feel like I was not wanted as a child, as a daughter. Um, and I just opened up a bottle of prescription that I knew my mom had had that she was taking for a legitimate condition she had, um, and took all of it. I don't know how many were in there. I knew that it was like a newly filled, your regular run of the mill, little orange prescription bottle. That's probably like a 30, maybe 60 day supply. Um, it was an antidepressant. So luckily it was labeled, like we knew exactly what it was. And I took the whole thing and I didn't even look back, dumped all of it in my mouth and just waited and sat on the floor of my room. And when my mom came home, I was still awake. I was still kicking it. Um, and I don't really remember much after that. I kind of blacked out, passed out. Um, we only lived like two minutes from a hospital, which I actually live very close to that same hospital in a, like the same neighborhood presently right now. Um, and yeah, I just remember her coming home and deteriorating, like screaming, crying. She knew exactly what I did because unfortunately at, when my mom was that age, um, she was doing the same thing and attempted to do the same thing. So um, they, she called 911. I was rushed to the emergency room. They gave me charcoal like to vomit it up. Um, I don't remember anything. I was sedated probably for the best. Um, luckily didn't have to have my stomach pumped or anything. Um, didn't have any like neurological deficits or any of these horrible things that could have happened. I was so lucky that they didn't. Um, but they did medicate me like set to sedate me so I could calm down. And I love that you shared, like I would wake up and there was a new tray of food in front of me. I would wake up and I'd have like new socks on like the, the grippy right, socks right. or like a blanket from home and I remember waking up I'm like how the hell did my New York Mets blanket get here where am I like for a split second I was like am I home wait nope not my socks not my socks um and yeah and from <clears throat> excuse me from there um I was sent to like the youth unit of the psychiatric center here yeah, in Binghamton. Love, love a good psych ward. Yeah. Um, I only stayed there, I believe four days. Um, I was asleep a lot. I was medicated a lot. Um, and all I remember from that experience is I was in my own room, um, and the lights were off most of the time. I slept most of the time. I had the TV on, um, I had to wear paper clothes. Um, yeah. Which is like kind of degrading, but we don't have to dive into that right now. It's not comforting. Like take no. all of your clothes off, put on this paper shirt and paper pants. Um, so you don't hang yourself with your clothes and sit there. And I was like, where's my mom? Where's my grandma? Yeah, that was, that's always like the tough part. Cause like, it's, I, I remember that I've been hospitalized three different times, like for like in psych. And I, I saw this woman or this person on TikTok and they create like clothing for psych centers and like, I love that like, cute little like patches on them, like, oh. like a breast pocket would go. And it says like, you know, like one step at a time. Or, I like, love that. Forward. And like, I know that like the risk is that somebody will attempt mm -hmm. to take their own life with said clothing but you know I I don't know it's just it's dehumanizing it's like really I dehumanizing like people and those are the things that people don't really talk about mm -hmm. like you know it, depending on what facility that you end up going to but when I was in my psych center I was there for a month specifically because 
I was waiting for a bed at another treatment center. So you were so, stuck. So like I was in limbo. Right. And, I, and like there was a tech there, or not the tech, the doctor who did my check in. He was like, "Hey, like your insurance isn't going to pay for you to be here anymore." And I was Thanks. Like, well, I need to be here because I need to go to treatment. Like at this point, like I wanted to stay clean. Um, but I knew if I went home, I would get high. Mm -hmm. And he was like, okay, well, I'm going to ask you again for your insurance. Do you want to harm yourself? You were like, oh. and I was like, oh, I was like, sir, I want to kill myself. And he was like, okay, I'm going to put that. Let me write that down. <laughs> and, um, and I'll see you next week. And it was like, cool. Like, and you know, he totally like. His transparency around that. <laughs> Am I allowed to share that? I don't know. Is he going to get. Yeah. Trouble? Who knows? <laughs> um, probably not. It was so many years ago and I won't tell you where I went. Absolutely. But it was really cool because you talked about like the adults in your life and how they can change the trajectory of your life. And like this adult alongside with my dad were like two people that he could have been like your beat. You're just another one in the system. You're going home yep. and, I, and I could have gotten high and be yep. dead. Yep. But he believed in me and he knew what my plan was, was I wanted to go. So sorry, I derailed it. No, you didn't at all. Thank you, you were, for sharing that. Yeah, totally. Um, and thank you for sharing that as well. Like, yeah. so like, what did you do when you left? I, so I was released from, and we call it CPEP. So uh, I'm just going to keep saying CPEP from CPEP. Um, I remember my mom had written a note to school because I have chronic ear issues and I have my whole life in my left ear. And the school was like well aware of that because I needed to sit like closer to the front of the classroom. So she wrote a note saying like, Kelly's had a double ear infection. She's been out for days. She'll come back to school when she comes back. My mom. Wait. Yeah. Wait. So there was no no information of like kelly has been hospitalized correct kelly had to do inpatient for correct wow and i remember going back to school and only one of my teachers and shout out to doc hemzik we called her doc because she was the only teacher in the school with a phd so it was easy to call her doc um pulled me aside and she was my homeroom teacher and she was like you know I saw the email from attendance like how is your ear doing like she genuinely was concerned and was like should can I move you closer to the front of the class like is there anything I can do bless her heart was just trying to like I love her she had no idea what was going on and I just was kind of like no no thank you but thank you like she was doing what she could do at the time under the false you know pretenses that she was under but um yeah looking back I understand that my mom did that because I was like freaking out I was like I don't want anyone to know about this um also small town vibes right, um didn't want to like get bullied absolutely yeah. they and I had seen this one girl in my graduating class be hospitalized in middle school and the things people were saying about her and the things teachers were saying about her like oh she's gonna be so far behind academically like small town usa vibes all the way um yeah so i missed like a week and a half two weeks of school um and volleyball i was pretty upset but it is what it is you know that's like all you care about as a teenager which is so funny that your world no, is that small it's hilarious i mean, um, i i hate yeah. that to like as an adult now um that like i traded six months of my life for the rest of my life i love that I mean? like yeah like i missed out on so much i had to redo my junior year yes. i did not graduate with my class i changed high schools but probably because of that for the best yeah um, but like it's at the time like teenagers and even adults like they think like well I can't I yeah can't go to rehab. this is the end yeah I can't go to a psych center I could like, never yeah my job won't support it the school mm -hmm. won't be okay my friends won't want to be friends with me what anymore. will others think exactly yeah but it's like 
fuck that. It's you. It's all about you. You do you, boo. Like, well, seriously, because like, I'd yeah. rather you be hospitalized than be, and dead. be alive. Yeah. Like, I, I wish someone had said that to me at the time. I know. Be like, get your ass in those paper clothes. <laughs> no, but literally, no, know, for real. Like, I'd, I'd rather be there than not being able to like live another day. And I think I didn't realize that till like. I was like 21 or 22 years old. Like I held so much anger because it's easier to be angry, right? Than to be like, I'm hurting. It's easier for our brains to be like, I'm fucking pissed off instead of like, oh, I'm really hurt deep down and I've been carrying this hurt for years. Um, I'm not mad at my mom. I totally understand why she did that. And at the end of the day, she was listening to me. I was the one freaking out. And she's like, I just want to find a solution. Like she was doing the best she could at the time. Um, totally. And yeah. And I went back to school, like nothing happened, but the best thing to come out of that was being set up with, um, a psychologist and a psychiatrist at our local university counseling center because they had a program for low-income folks where we could be seen at no cost um, by PhD students and professors who were practicing for their clinical hours. And her name was Jessica. And I saw Jessica for the remaining three years uh, before I went to college and had a treatment plan, started medication for the first time, attempted family therapy, um, and I say attempt because that's the key word is we gave it a shot um, and that's what matters. And um, I can I can thank God say that I have not actively attempted to take my life since. And it's almost been, it'll be 10 years this time next year. Um, unbelievable. That unbelievable. I'm still here. It's not unbelievable. It is believable. It is unbelievable though. No, what you said, so like to me, I'm like, it's unbelievable that that happened, but then when I'm at my lowest points, I'm like, it's unbelievable that I'm still here because I was so set on just checking out. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that's, we're all looking at, in some capacity, at some points in our lives, a way to escape the feelings that we always experience. Like, avoid flee I, as you flee, said earlier flee flee, flee the nation <laughs> but like seriously like I don't like feeling uncomfortable mm -hmm. I will do literally anything in my power to not feel uncomfortable as um, any human will yeah like will Absolutely. I like I'd rather like you know play video games for like two hours instead of like reading a book that challenges me and makes me feel uncomfortable like oh. I'd rather take a nap instead of like call somebody and talk about what I'm feeling like I feel that I don't know it's just it's challenging sometimes to continue to push ourselves like even when we are in good places too like this is not the end-all be-all either and I think that's like the toughest part is like there's no recovered like there's no mm -hmm. I'm like, done I'm fixed I'm healed I did it. I did no yep. because like there are still many a times where I go into a social situation like I went to a wedding in Boston and yes was like, how was that oh it was amazing you um, looked so good thanks it was of a course. very very fun wedding it was a very very fun wedding and I love the bride and groom is it your sister-in-law no, um, oh. Mr. and Mrs. Dunleavy, they are- Shout out to them. I know, I love them. <laughs> um, I accidentally stole Kira's hairdryer sitting right here. Um, accidentally packed it. But, well, Tim accidentally packed it. But anyway, at the wedding, we all went out afterwards and it was so much fun and we had a blast and, you know, for the people that I think I mentioned it, like I'm a person in recovery um, from drugs and alcohol and self-harm and depression and anxiety and CPTSD and all of the things. So either way, like, you know, I won't explain like the whole process because it'll take like 10 years, mm -hmm. but <laughs> I got into a situation where I had to be like 
you know, like separated from the group because like the group was going yeah. to the bar and like, yeah. it just was like, I couldn't get in. And it was like, I forgot my ID basically because I suck and I don't drink, but like, I wanted to be with the people. You don't I suck. Yeah. I couldn't be with the people. And I ended up having like this straight up anxiety attack where like, I felt embarrassed. I felt different. I felt alone. I felt like, mm. you know, I can't hang out with these people and you know, like I went through this whole spiral and like, thank God, my partner, Tim. We like, love you, Tim. We love Tim. He just like held me. He literally held me and I kept trying to flee. <laughs> I love how that's the theme. I kept trying to flee. We're going to start selling t-shirts at that. <laughs> I want to flee. Oh my God, please. Um, I would buy one and I'm sure people would. We'll wear them. Yes. Um, <laughs> oh my God. So basically I ended up like kept trying to go back to the hotel room and being like, I don't, uh, 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 I want to just go to bed because like fleeing. And he kept like, kind of like, he wasn't like forcing me to stand there, but he kept saying like, you're okay. Like you're, you are okay. Like you're safe. You're not in danger. You know, like, like just be here be here and just breathe and we were breathing together yeah oh my god the amount of need me one like that dude the amount of abusive relationships i've been in is ridiculous like, period I and on that note we end the pod no i'm kidding yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, no okay. for real though <laughs> Thanks like for guys goodbye you you have found your person yeah no, for like he's showing up how you need him to yeah I, like i realized like i we have like eight and a half years clean right actively in therapy, actively doing things that are therapeutic for me, um, you know, and I, I just lied. I'm actively seeking a therapist. I don't want to lie to my the listeners here, but what I will say is in that moment while I was having this panic attack, it felt like I was like eight years old again. Yeah. I was like, not included and that I was different and fucking that sucks it sucks so bad yeah and I allowed somebody to like share that moment with me and be vulnerable in real time which is super hard and I got through it and Kira god bless her the bride she was like fuck this place we're all going to go to a place that you can go to. And she moved her entire, oh her entire party to another place so we could all be together. And she didn't even know that I was having a panic attack. She didn't even know I was that upset. And she was like, no, like we're not. And then like one of his other friends, Kenny, shout out Kenny. Um, oh my God. Me, he was like, we're not going to leave one of our own behind. And I was like, Kristen, stop. The tears are like welling in my eyes. <laughs> and like, I, wow. if I just went back to the hotel room, I wouldn't have been able to experience that, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like sticking it out and letting people love you. even when you don't feel like that, you're Accept loved. it. Yeah. Like I felt like I was the most alone person in the world and it's, and I was also on my period. So that was part of it. Um, That's out of our control. Like yeah. unhinged. Yeah. But it was really cool to like know that even though like my life is really pretty rad that I still have stuff where it can fling me back into being eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Mm -hmm. And like feeling like my whole entire world is ending. My therapist said what you're explaining in a really good way. She was like, obviously like I, if you want to get technical with it, have been doing CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy for years, mm -hmm. like since I was like 12, as most of us have. But she was like, Kelly, you avoid and you flee because you don't want to like do the work of breaking up these automatic thought processes. Like our brains automatically flip back into like, you felt like you were eight years old. And I felt like I was 12 years old when I just talked about those girls bullying me. And like, we have to break up those automatic spirals that our brains go to. And it's so fucking hard and it's so much fucking work. And it really does fucking suck. Like putting in this work to try to retrain our brains, but that's it like, so that's bad. it. Yeah. That's, that's, that's all that it is. Like, I don't know for like the listeners out there that like have a tough time um, or feel like it's impossible to like break that up. Like I know that 
I am not a clinician, I'm not a therapist, but like mindfulness activities really help me. Um, you know, I don't remember what it's called, but it's where you look for like the, the five senses, you know, like five things you see, four things you can touch. Absolutely. Three things you can hear, smell, hear, smell taste. And then taste. Um, and that just brings me back to home base. So I'm not like up in the air somewhere. Yes. So I don't know. I'm just grateful that we have this opportunity to yes. bring on guests and talk a little bit about ourselves and just have it be like this casual conversation, which it doesn't have to be so serious. It is serious, but it doesn't need to be this like hush hush. Absolutely. We got to whisper about it. Like, no. And it doesn't have to be like so structured or I hate to use the word like professional, but yeah, it doesn't have to be like this, like we're not talking about mental health. Like we have to have like like folks assume like, oh, we're talking about mental health. So we're talking about psychology. So we need like this academic or clinical component. Yes, but no, we don't. Like we're just having a conversation. We're I just two friends. Yeah, I I somewhat do, but don't. I really don't. I'm just, I imposter syndrome out the ass. I'm like, where am I? What's going on? Um, But all day, every day, every day, flee. Um, but, you, but you did earn where you are today. You did Thank do you, this. Was, this was all steps that you took with your support system. But like, you know, we don't just like end up in places by accident, like just because like we we mistook our right. role and we're like, Bleh. like when I stand up, yeah, like when I stand up on a stage in front of like six hundred people, I'm like, and they're true? excited. Yeah, they <laughs> and they're hear like. You. Like all jazzed about and it. the the like superintendents like and now and you're like at like a WWE wrestling match but really you're just talking about like mental health and your suicide attempt but the kids and teachers and you look out and they're all just like yeah like yeah I mean talk it's about crazy. like imposter syndrome like yeah. when I we should like, we'll do an episode on that we, for we, sure we need to because like absolutely I, like I did this one thing where. Somebody, uh, Rebecca Bonner, who's the head of the, she's the old head of the Bridgeway School. Um, Angela Smith is now the head of the Bridgeway School, which is the recovery high school in Pennsylvania. Um, she said, she was like, we want you to speak, come here in a couple of days. And I was like, cool, I'll do it. She didn't tell me who, she didn't tell me what, she didn't tell me why, she just told me where to go. And I am sitting in front, there's a bunch of press, a bunch of photographers and videographers and I'm like what the fuck and I'm speaking in front of um mayor Tom Wolf and um former mayor Michael Bloomberg and Mikey Mikey and um we don't it, like him <laughs> he was doing the whole 50 million dollar donation at that time to the we do pandemic. like him if if you're going to open your checkbook, we love you. Yes, it was, uh, it was, um, it was actually like pretty incredible because I think money went towards the Bridgeway school, which was very nice. Um, but it was like, am I really speaking in front of these people right now? And I have this letter from governor Tom Wolf and he gave me like, he thanked me on, on a letter and I should frame that. As he should at the least. Yes. But imposter syndrome, I was like, I don't belong here. Okay. We're definitely going to dive into that. And if folks have any topics or anything that they'd like to hear us talk about, you can always email us. You can DM leave us. a comment. Yeah, leave a comment. DM us. You can put up a billboard in your hometown. We don't care. We're happy to talk about what you guys want to hear. And we're happy to take any feedback, suggestions, um, because we don't grow without feedback, as we both know, as, as folks who speak and go into schools and share about our experiences for a living. Like, we appreciate feedback. But nonetheless, yeah, if, if any yeah. of y'all want to be on the pod, just shoot us a shoot us a message. Absolutely, we want to wrap it up with a call for guests, a call for topics. You you are the folks listening. You're driving this work. You are the reason that we exist and are sitting here. So, um, 
please do email us, comment, and um, most importantly, subscribe. You can hear us on any podcast platform, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, um, Anchor. We're using the Anchor app as well. So if you don't see us on a platform that you'd like to see us on, shoot us an email and we'll figure it out. We're learning as we go tech-wise. So yeah, and our email is uh, the how we got here pod at gmail.com so that'll be in the description um but yeah folks we want to just say thank you this is it's just our first episode and we're already killing it in my opinion (laughs) so this has been a joy it's been a great episode um we're excited for you to hear some of our first few episodes with some really fun and interesting and distinguished colleagues and folks that are friends and um yeah what what are your final thoughts Kristen thanks for listening all thanks for uh, being here we're looking forward to having you tune in next time so keep, keep an eye out yeah and yeah don't forget to subscribe thanks Thanks, everyone